Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. Someone's night out has ruined the day for a business owner on the far northwest side. San Antonio police say a driver crashed into the front of the tattoo shop overnight, shattering the glass windows and door. All of this happening at Calabra Road near 1604. As Katrina Weber reports, this is just the latest trouble in a tough year for that shop owner. I was kind of in shock seeing everything. Seeing quickly turned into doing for Lorencio Bacchus cleaning up the mess someone made of the shop overnight. San Antonio police say an SUV slammed into the front of the ink retreat on Calabra Road near Loop 1604, then took off. It left shattered glass on the ground and none where it used to be. They said that she hopped the curb going the wrong way on the street and kind of backed in. Baca spoke to us I through what used to be his front door. Luckily, his shop wasn't open when this happened around one this morning. Honestly, uh, I'm happy to have faith in the Lord, and I hope that whoever hit, hit, they're okay. Had it not been for a call from someone at that convenience store, the owner says he might not have known this was going on. He says his burglar alarm never went off. That's because the door didn't open at all. The damage was much worse in person than what he could see on his security cameras app. And it's just the latest trouble in a tough year of coronavirus shutdowns and a business killing winter storm. And then this happens, you know, and uh, it's just one thing after another, but what can you do? What police want to do is catch the driver who did this, someone in a gray Mitsubishi Outlander that probably has some damage itself now. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Police are investigating after a man was found shot to death under a bridge. Police tell us it happened around 10 o'clock last night at the intersection of Fredericksburg Road and West Drive. Officers tell us when they got there, they found the man dead under a bridge. Police say they have no witnesses or suspects. Right now, the investigation is ongoing. The first of the new Johnson and Johnson vaccines have finally arrived here in San Antonio and teachers were the first to receive them. The Stamp Center in Almost Park received 100 of these shots and immediately administered them to the San Antonio ISD. The Johnson and Johnson vaccines are unique because only one shot is required. The Stamp Center joined with SAISD and District 1 City Councilman Roberto Trevino to get these vaccines into the arms of educators first. One SAISD teacher says he is grateful to have received the shot. This is the right direction for teachers, uh, getting the vaccination, coaches getting the vaccination just so we can uh, be allowed to help out more kids, be around the kids and um, keep, keep our safety in mind. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was granted emergency use by the FDA on February 27th. All 40,000 COVID-19 vaccine appointments at the Alamo Dome have been filled. Metro Health says there will be 10,000 appointments each week until April 3rd. The city says it took two and a half hours for all 40,000 of those appointments to be filled. Only those in phase 1A and 1B, as well as teachers, school and child care staff are eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Meanwhile, the WellMed vaccination hotline reopened at 8 o'clock this morning. WellMed opened for 9,000 appointments for the Moderna doses on Friday. And the number will remain active until all of the slots are filled. The number to call is on your screen right now. It is 833-968-1745. If you want some more information on who is eligible for the vaccine or how to register, you can go to ksat.com. As far as the numbers go here in Bear County, local health officials reported 230 new cases of COVID-19 along with no new deaths. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says the weekly positivity rate has dropped all the way down to 2.6%. That is the lowest it has been since the pandemic began. Less than 300 people are in the hospital with the virus as well. He says that the county's COVID-19 trends are improving and our current risk level is low. There are some new guidelines coming in from the CDC, which says that those who have been fully vaccinated can now gather in small groups without masks. And now the latest numbers show that more Americans have been fully vaccinated than have been infected with the coronavirus. Ike Jache is reporting that health officials are still stressing, though, the need to maintain travel restrictions. 
Today, a sign of hope for those who've completed their COVID-19 vaccinations. Looking forward to being out and seeing people and being around people again without having a mask on. The CDC issuing new guidelines saying fully vaccinated people, that is those who've waited two weeks after receiving their second dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or one dose of the Johnson & Johnson shot, can gather in small groups indoors without wearing masks. As long as you're keeping it pretty small, I think it's fine. I think I wouldn't get a large group together, multiple families. That's where it starts getting risky. But other than that, I think you can, as long as people are being reasonably careful. Right now, the number of Americans who've received a shot has surpassed the number of Americans infected with the virus. All across the country, max vaccination sites are opening, like this one in Seattle and another at the Motor Speedway in New Hampshire. Yet health experts say some travel restrictions need to remain. Every time that there's a surge in travel, we have a surge in cases in this country. The CDC also saying those who are vaccinated still need to wear masks in public, citing a need to protect those who aren't vaccinated or who might have underlying conditions. It's a guideline coming at a time when several states are actively rolling back restrictions. Wyoming becoming the sixth state to lift their mask mandate, joining 11 other states with no mask mandates. Two more states are also planning to lift restrictions next month. And as spring break looms, so do those looking to take advantage. In Florida, spring breakers packing bars and clubs in Fort Lauderdale, not a mask in sight. Now, a new report found that the more contagious UK variant is widespread in Houston's wastewater. This as Texas still plans to lift their mask mandate this week. Ike Jachi, ABC News, Washington. Be sure and join us on March 16th for KSAT's second Parenting in a Pandemic live stream special. You can watch it online on our mobile news app or our free streaming app that works with Roku and other smart TV devices. Myra Arthur is the host and she'll be joined by a panel of professionals who are also parents to tackle some important issues like mental health and addiction to technology. You can join the conversation and share your biggest questions and concerns by sending in your questions right now to KSAT.com. Wholesome Meats is a new company that works with farmers and ranchers. How this company is helping the San Antonio Food Bank, it's still ahead. And Dak Prescott signed a huge contract extension for the Dallas Cowboys. How it compares to other players in the league like Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson coming up in sports. Wholesome Meats is a new company that works with farmers and ranchers in multiple states, including right here in Texas. Their burgers are products of a natural process called regenerative farming. And as Max Massey shows us, a local San Antonio restaurant is using the Wholesome Foods burgers to help the San Antonio Food Bank. They are really amazing. Lisa is the owner of The Cove, a local restaurant that aims for fresh, organic, sustainable, and delicious food. I really can tell the, the, the quality of the meat. Um, put it right here on the, on the grill. I mean, it just, it tastes so good. And this is their wholesome meats burger. This concept of regeneration is so exciting because it's not just sustainable. We're not just sustaining something. We're actually regenerating something. We're going to dip out of this package real quick for some breaking news. Governor Greg Abbott is at the Texas-Mexico border in Mission, Texas. He's talking about border security and efforts among that humanitarian crisis down there. He just started talking. Let's listen in. Let me begin by making one point very clear. There is a crisis on the Texas border right now uh, with the overwhelming number of people who are coming across the border. This crisis is a result of President Biden's open border policies. It invites illegal immigration and is creating a humanitarian crisis in Texas right now uh, that will grow increasingly worse by the day. In getting information in my meeting with the Border Patrol, I learned these things. And that is one of the reasons for this crisis that has led to a dramatic change in just a few months is the change in policy. There was a policy uh, that uh, people who had come across the border illegally would be returned across the border. And there was also the remain in Mexico policy. Uh, with the elimination of those policies, that led to a dramatic increase in the number of people coming across the border. Uh, second, uh, the, the Border Patrol told me that they did inform the Biden administration and let them know that this influx was coming. 
So it's not as if the Biden administration didn't know about it. And it's not as if they didn't have time to get prepared for it. But it is clear they are completely unprepared for what is going on the border now. And they're going to be even more unprepared for what will be happening in the coming months. What the Border Patrol told me, and this is actually part of the cartel strategy, because of the volume of people coming across the border, the Border Patrol that makes uh, the, the arrest, they have to engage quite literally in babysitting. And while they're doing babysitting, that provides an opportunity for the cartels to be able to bring other people across the border illegally. More about the cartels in a second. Two factoids that the Border Patrol shared with me. Just this calendar year alone, there have been more than 800 criminal aliens apprehended. Those were criminals, uh, violent criminals, who had been previously arrested in the United States and deported, who came across the border again. Among those included 78 sex offenders and 62 gang members, including gang members from MS-13. And know this, cartels, they are ramping up trafficking across the border. They're exploiting women and children, and they are overwhelming Border Patrol resources. The Border Patrol has made very clear to me the way this strategy works. The cartels, they are involved in every single one of these border crossings that we see. But more important, the cartels are even more involved in the crossings that we do not see. The strategy of the cartels is to overwhelm Border Patrol agents and law enforcement officials. And when the Border Patrol agents are so completely overwhelmed, it's during those moments that the cartels will bring across the border even the more dangerous elements. It could be uh, people who are violent criminals, or it could be people who are from what are called uh, special interest countries. Those are interests, uh, those are countries that are uh, uh, raised concerns uh, about the danger they may pose to the United States, such as people coming from countries like Iran and Iraq, China, as well as elsewhere. The cartels are quite literally being enriched because of the policies that are being used by the Biden administration. He, the Biden administration is helping the cartels make more money and grow more power. They are uh, allowing smugglers who are members of the cartel on the Mexican side bring in narcotic smugglers, special interest aliens, as well as drugs that include fentanyl, cocaine, and opioids. One thing that is clear from all the observations and all the information that I've been able to gather, and that is we need more ICE detention facilities in this area immediately. But the Border Patrol simply is not either given enough resources and do not have enough resources to be able to deal with this overwhelming tidal wave of people who are coming across the border. Let me be clear. Border Patrol has a role to play. The role that Border Patrol plays is they're the ones who have to make the arrest and make the detention. Then the responsibility goes to ICE. It is up to ICE to detain, to test, and to quarantine anybody who's coming across the border who may have exposure to COVID. The Biden administration does not want to talk about ICE. The Biden administration is joining together with progressives, pretending that ICE is going to go away or be eliminated. ICE is essential in this entire process, and we expect the president and the Biden administration to step up, fully fund, and actually add additional funding to the ICE program. As well as You've been listening to Governor Greg Abbott. He is at the border in Mission, Texas, discussing what he is calling a major crisis that is underway right now all along the Texas border. And he is pointing a finger directly at the Biden administration, saying that Biden's policy of opening the border is creating major problems uh, for Border Patrol and allowing basically the drug cartels of Mexico to run rampant. Yeah, Governor Abbott says that the Biden policies are now completely, have caused them to be completely unprepared and they will continue 
to be unprepared. The Biden administration, he said the Border Patrol is basically babysitting right now. And he says more than 800 violent criminals who were deported have returned to this country. That includes 78 sex offenders and 62 gang members. Now, what the governor is saying is that this is all part of a bigger plan by the cartels of Mexico to distract. Um, in other words, they're they're responsible for this big influx. They're in, encouraging it. And as a result, Border Patrol is distracted by that, while they meantime have been able to allow a criminal element to enter the country in a separate type of border crossing, both of which uh, he is saying requires there to be more detention centers and more funding for Border Patrol in order to handle this new crisis. But once again, he is calling it a crisis on the border and that the Biden administration is completely unprepared for what's going on down there. Of course, we'll have more for you on our website, KSAT.com, and we will continue to follow his visit down there in Mission and have more on the afternoon newscast, KSAT 12 News at 5, and once again at 6. And I believe that live stream of the governor can be found right now on KSAT.com if you want to continue listening to his comments. Meantime, it's time to talk weather. Yeah, so it, it seems like every day we get a little warmer, a little warmer. Cloudy and foggy and rainy in the morning, but a little warmer in the afternoon. It's going a lot more like March these days. Yes. Tell you. Uh, yeah, the clouds have been there most of the morning. We're starting to see a few peaks of sun. Temperatures are on the way up as a result. And the aquifer is down four tenths of a foot to 660.7 in your pollen count. Long list here. We had five allergens today, all in the low category, thankfully. Mole, tackberry, mulberry, juniper, and pine. We'll talk about uh, the spring lake weather, how long it's going to continue, and whether or not we are expecting storms over the weekend. That latest forecast is coming up. Welcome back. We got a report from Noah yesterday talking about the month of February. A quick look back. It was the 19th coldest February for the country in the 127 years that records have been kept. It was also the coldest February since 1989 for the country. And we had a record snow coverage on February 16th. Records on that have been kept since 2003. There was more snow on the ground across the country than we had seen since those records had been kept. And for Texas specifically, it was the 11th coldest February on record. So just a few notes there. I think we know it was cold. And uh, now that we're moving into March, things are warming up, right? We're starting to see some much warmer numbers. Take a look at this time lapse. And you can see that the clouds were lowering this morning. We had the fog and the drizzle. And then we saw them lift and now we're looking at a little bit of blue sky in some spots, even here in San Antonio, which has boosted the temperatures 71. Yesterday we overachieved, jumped into the low 70s. If we see more sun this afternoon, we'll certainly overachieve. We could see those numbers jump up into the mid even upper 70s in some spots. Southerly winds at 16 miles per hour. That's pumping in quite a bit of moisture and it is allowing for uh, the warmer readings. There you look at the uh, satellite picture and you can see the clouds racing south to north but breaking up some here across Barrett County. And uh, temperature wise, 74 Castroville, 64 in Bernie State, still a little bit more cloudy there. 74 New Braunfels, 73 in Seguin. More sun around Kennedy, so numbers there now in the mid to upper 70s. Underneath the thicker cloud cover, still in the 60s for Kerrville and Rock Springs. Dew points have been steadily rising. It's sticky, it's humid out there. That doesn't change really all the way until Saturday. It's not going to be until Saturday night that some drier air eventually works in. So the dew point tracker shows. Well, I don't know what that shows. That's not correct. I don't know. Sometimes the data just falls out, but uh, we'll see some humid conditions until the weekend. And then once the front comes through, that dew point will drop off into the 40s. Here's a bigger picture with the uh, satellite view here in the state of Texas. A lot of Texas is seeing cloud cover San Antonio to Dallas down to Houston and then a little bit of rain out in parts of New Mexico. What we're watching is this big storm system out here. It's a giant storm system. I mean, this takes up a lot of real estate. This is going to work in across the western half of the country, eventually work its way towards Texas. It's going to be responsible, I think, for some severe weather, some good snows across the plains, and we'll feel some of it. I don't think we're going to get the brunt of the energy, but we will get some storms down here, here and a few of them could be on the strong side. That's possible as it uh, moves a little bit closer. It's going to take until Saturday that we start to see some storms around the area. And I think we'll see a line of storms, probably San Antonio all the way up to parts of Kansas. Now, I think it's moving out by midday on Sunday and we'll get to dry out some Sunday afternoon. But again, we'll have to watch for the possibility of a couple strong storms here and there. Today, mid 70s for highs, 75, mostly cloudy, mostly cloudy really across the board. We'll see that 
situation where we get morning clouds and then some afternoon sun, maybe a stray shower here or there, and then a 60% chance of rain Saturday night into Sunday morning as we spring forward, some scattered showers and storms, and it will cool us down some too. 72 on Sunday, 76 on Monday. Now we're going to toss to a required EAS test. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dak Prescott is one rich man today. Now he just has to prove he's worth it. The Dallas Cowboys reached an agreement on a contract extension for the Cowboys quarterback. It is a four-year deal worth $160 million and no trade clause. The turning point for the contract came as the Cowboys relented and decided to go with a four-year deal rather than the five-year contract they wanted last year. But how about these numbers? You might want to write these down just to look at them later. All right, of the $160 million he got, $126 million is guaranteed. $66 million just to sign $75 million in the first year alone. Both are new NFL records, by the way. The contract will average $42 million a season in the first three years. And here's a re big reason why Dallas and Dak did the deal, because of the long-term contract, Prescott's salary cap hit for this season will now only be $22.2 million, according to ESPN, instead of 37.7 that would have accompanied the franchise tag again. That's a savings of $15.5 million. Here's how Dak's deal compares to other NFL mega deals. This is why I say he's got to prove this thing. Mahomes has a $450 million 10-year deal. There's Prescott, second behind Mahomes. Mahomes been to two Super Bowls. Prescott, none. He's got to prove it. 160 million. Deshaun Watson, 156 million. Wilson, 140 million over four years. That's 35 million a year for him. All right, the Spurs are still uh, working out after they uh, took that time off for the All-Star weekend. Tomorrow, they hit the road at Dallas to start the second half of the season. And then they're back home against Orlando. And then they go out of town again for like five on the road, starting Sunday at 5.30 in Philadelphia. Remember, they've got like 40 games over the next 68 days. Hey, spring break is here, and that means an entire year has passed since the start of the pandemic. It also means those travel vouchers you may have received for postponing your trip last year are gonna expire soon. Coming up today at five, what you should do so you don't lose your credits or money. Tomorrow, the mask mandate in Texas will be lifted in the state and there is growing concern and confusion among the general public as well as essential workers. Will this be safe? Joining us now from the Washington Post to explain is Abba Bateri. Good afternoon. First, Abba, now you went into great detail on your article that you wrote for the Washington Post about this mandate being lifted by the governor. Now, in stores like HEB and Walmart, just yesterday, HEB basically kind of reversed themselves. They'll now have signs and make announcements reminding customers to wear a mask while shopping. Vendors and partners are going to continue to wear their masks. So I just wanted to get your reaction to that change just yesterday. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of these guidelines become very fluid and they sort of change from chain to chain and week to week. And that's part of the issue here. Um, what I'm hearing from workers is that these are very fraught situations as it is. Um, mask wearing has become this hot button issue. And most companies, even if they're saying masks are encouraged or required, aren't really encouraging their employees to enforce that. So enforcement is spotty. Um, and that makes it all the more difficult. And now the fear among essential workers, at least, is that, you know, without the backing of the government, 
that it's going to be that much harder to require customers to wear masks, even if that's the official policy. Are you thinking maybe there in the general public, people are going to kind of revert back to the way they used to shop right at the start of the pandemic where they did everything online and they had, you know, they just avoided going to stores and just avoided the whole controversy. Let's just go back to being contactless. I think there's certainly a big part of the population that is thinking of doing that. There's also the contingent that says, hey, I really miss going out freely and like browsing at the store and just living my normal life. And they're really excited to do that. So I think we're going to see sort of extremes on either end. And we're going to see the folks in the middle, too, who are going to keep going to the stores, but using the same precautions that they've been using for the last several months. You know, when, they, uh, when the pandemic first hit, a lot of the uh, folks who were working at grocery stores and things like that were getting hailed as heroes because they were willing to kind of put their lives on the line to get to work to make sure folks had groceries and could get those shelves restocked. But yet it doesn't seem like their line for the vaccine kind of reflects how much people were concerned about them at the very beginning. Do you see that changing anytime soon or are we too deep into the vaccine being distributed to, to make a change now? We're pretty deep into the vaccine distribution, and this is another case where it really depends on the state or the region that you're in. A number of states are giving priority to grocery workers and other retail and essential workers, but Texas and Mississippi are not. And so this is one more area where these workers are saying that they're they're sort of being sidelined after a year of working in the pandemic. Are we just dealing in a mask fatigue situation at this point where People know there's a risk out there, but they also know the numbers are lower. If they need to go to the hospital, there's room at the hospital. So let's all just calm down. Absolutely. I think a lot of people are tired or there's just a lot of fatigue. Like you said, we're a year in um, and there are there is a light at the end of the tunnel now. There's a vaccine. There are signs of hope. And I think a lot of people are just feeling like they're over it all. Yeah, you found a lot of folks who were concerned, especially those who work in, in retail, Walmarts and HEBs and Targets and things like that. But were there some folks who maybe go to work every day and, and are not that concerned? Were there, did you come across any, any of those folks in your, in your story? Absolutely. I talked to a few folks like that. And I also talked to a, bun- a number of workers who were very worried but said that their colleagues weren't. Um, one who worked at a steakhouse near Dallas said that even when there were mask mandates in place, a lot of her coworkers found ways around that, either by wearing sheer masks or you know, making sure their masks had holes as a way to protest the policy. And so there is definitely a contingent of workers that is very relieved that they no longer you know, have this statewide mandate to wear a mask at work. It's certainly leaving a lot of personal choice out there. Thank you so much for joining us. Very informative, and we hope you stay safe and healthy, Abba. Thank you. All right, outside with live cam. A little cloudy this morning, a little foggy. Some big, huge raindrops this morning. Big yeah. ones, like real big. Big ones, huh? But not it, very many of them. It was murky. Well, that's right, and that's sort of what we're going to see, I think, through the rest of the week. These light showers here and there, but it's just not going to amount to much. Uh, we started off with some fog and drizzle. It was sort of a messy morning commute, but the skies are starting to clear, and we're seeing more sun, and that's boosting temperatures. As you look across the state right now, we're at 71 here in San Antonio, already near 80 in Corpus and Brownsville, and it, it's going to be a mild day across much of the state. If you are doing some traveling, I know it is spring break. Uh, well, that looks pretty good statewide. The one thing you may have to deal with is some wind as you get up across parts of West Texas and North Texas. Winds are really gusty there today. We're seeing some breezy winds too, but not as strong as what they're seeing up towards Midland, Amarillo and Dallas. We'll be up around 75, if not a little bit warmer this afternoon here in town and you see the cloud cover is pretty expansive uh, from San Antonio all the way up to Dallas and Houston. Some uh, mostly cloudy skies, but breaks here and there. And again, that's enough to boost those temperatures. No rain on the radar. You see some uh, the ground clutter there, but that is not rain. We've seen a few very light returns today, but again, it's not amounting mounting to much at all. Our forecast 73 2 o'clock 75 4 o'clock. 72 at 6 o'clock will drop down to 70 at 8 o'clock with all that humidity. We won't get all that cool tonight either. We're going to talk more about the forecast going forward. Yes, there is a chance for some springtime spring like thunderstorms by the weekend. We'll have more on that in just a bit, guys. Thank you, Justin. The Spider-Man actor teaming up with the Avengers Endgame directors of a very different film. We get an inside look of Cherry still ahead in the spotlight.
Tesla shares up this morning after the stock dropped almost 6% yesterday. Why investors say the stock is down from its record high. Still ahead in your daily Cheddar report. And robocalls seem to be picking up to pre-pandemic levels over the last month after the break. How many scam calls were tracked each day in February? Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Hello, everyone. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. Shares of Tesla are moving higher this morning after a volatile Monday that saw the stock drop almost 6%. The stock is now down by a third from its record high of nearly $900 a share back in January. This comes amid a broader tech sell-off as investors continue to worry about rising interest rates. Meanwhile, Bitcoin ripping past $54,000 this morning, hitting a 24-hour high after a solid day on Monday, which saw the price jump 1.5%. This comes after a volatile week last week, which saw the price dip to $46,000. $1,000. Analysts, though, are feeling optimistic about Bitcoin. They're anticipating that those $1,400 stimulus checks will help flow some more money into the digital coin. And Frontier Airlines is filing for an IPO yet again, this after they withdrew their attempt over the summer. As vaccination efforts ramp up, the budget air carrier is gearing up for a travel rebound, this after passenger levels fell to their lowest point in 40 years amid the pandemic. When it does go public, the Denver-based airline plans to list at the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol F-R-N-T. And that's your Cheddar Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado, coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. More consumer news this noon. New data from Umail says Americans received more than 4.6 billion robocalls in February. That's up 15% compared to January. Umail tracks robo traffic across the United States. About 159.1 million robocalls were placed each day last month. Thursla got one every day. Five. Leading, five every day. Well, that's why the numbers are so high. The leading illegal types of robocalls involved car warranties, hate those, and health related scams. And the Social Security one is especially yeah. cruel. Tom Holland reteamed with the directors of the latest Avengers movies to bring a more down to earth and serious subject to the screen. CNN's Rick Damagella gives us a look at Cherry. I'm 23 years old and. Sometimes I wonder if life was wasted on me. Tom Holland went to physical extremes in his portrayal of a drug addicted veteran with PTSD in Cherry. I joined the army. Why would you do that? Sometimes I feel like I've already seen everything that's gonna happen. I think the uh, physical transformation for us was quite a big way to convey time passing throughout the film, um, his abuse of heroin, um, and also his uh, reaction to trauma. Um, the biggest thing for me was losing weight. I, I spent the first three months uh, leading up to shooting, just doing everything I could to cut as much weight as possible. I felt a huge weight of responsibility in, in telling a story like this because it is not just Emily or Cherry's story. I mean, this is the story of millions of people worldwide. I and I just wanted to be able to do them justice. Avengers Endgame directors the Russo brothers made deliberate choices about the audience and filming locations. We made this movie for our kids because we feel like Gen Z is the most vulnerable generation to opioids, these pills that have been scientifically engineered uh, to make you addicted to them, to, you know, turn revenues. There's a stylization and a visual intensity that we thought would appeal to Gen Z because they consume information in a very different way than the rest of us do. Cleveland, Ohio, the industrial Midwest, that area is basically ground zero for the opioid epidemic. It hit there first, it hit there stronger. So the fact that we could go there to tell this story um, in the place that, that is helping inform and drive the epidemic, I think was very meaningful. We're gonna make it through this. I love you. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Looking outside, the sun making an appearance finally. Yeah, we jumped into the 70s and uh, we're not looking back here. I think we'll continue to climb into the mid 70s this afternoon. 71 right now. That's our high temperature so far today. 58 was low this morning. It's not all that cold. We'll see overnight lows moderate as we finish out the week. Averages are 72 and 49. So we'll be a little bit above average today in both regards. Records are 92 and 25 set back in 1911 and 1996. Your seven day forecast is coming up.
definitely spring break, spring break weather. It's not. Smell, it smells like spring. It smells like spring? Yeah. That's not bad out there. <laughs> Except there's no flowers blooming. Cause well, I was going to say the one thing that's missing right now that we generally at this point would be smelling that uh, grape Kool-Aid mm -hmm. um, the, flower. The mountain laurel. The mountain laurel. Yeah. And you, the, nothing. Nothing. No, it's <laughs> all pretty, uh, pretty ugly out there still. A lot of brown. We've just got to be patient with that stuff, though. That's what they keep telling us. It's, it's going to grow back. Just may take some time. But yes, the landscape's not looking great right now. You know, we could use a little bit of rain to help out. We may get some this weekend, but we're not going to get any this week. If we do see any, it's going to be the light sprinkly stuff that uh, kind of like what we saw this morning, a shower here or there. Outside right now, clouds trying to break up and temperatures sitting at 71 degrees at the airport, 71 Stinson, 71 Kelly, 73 Randolph. And these numbers are on their way up. Southerly winds at 16 and the winds have been gusty from time to time today. We'll continue to see that. Satellite picture kind of tells a story here. We were cloudy earlier, and then you see these clouds sort of breaking up some more sun, especially as you get south and east of San Antonio. Less sun as you go west. Hondo, you're still cloudy to mostly cloudy at this hour. So your temperature's a little bit lower. 70 there, 71 at the airport, as we mentioned, where there's more sun, 73 in Seguin, and we're closing in on 80 degrees in Pleasanton. It's going to be a warm day there for sure. And a few other spots may climb over 80 degrees, especially south and east of San Antonio. The clouds thicker up around Rock Springs, Junction, Kerrville. Temperatures are still in the 60s there. Two points on the rise. They're in the upper 50s. We're climbing into the muggy territory, and uh, it stays that way for a, a good period here. Uh, it's going to feel, again, a lot like spring with forecast humidity jumping up into the uh, 50s and 60s for the most part. And that'll keep overnight lows from getting too cool. Uh, each and every morning, we'll see these dew points in the 60s during the afternoon, uh, probably upper 50s, low 60s. And that's enough to where you can feel the humidity in the air. As you look at the big picture here, cloud stretch from San Antonio up to Dallas, though no rain with any of the cloud cover. Some showers across parts of Arizona and New Mexico. But the uh, big story is this big area of low pressure rotating just off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. This is a massive system that will be working its way into the country and will bring a variety of weather as it does, especially as it moves towards the plains. Uh, the forecast is for it to move slowly, so California will get rain first and then works its way through the mountains and then towards uh, Texas. We'll start to feel uh, the chance for rain here, at least uh, a frontal battery that will bring in some drier air, but it will kick up some showers and storms. It looks like the best window for that will be Saturday night into Sunday morning. I think we could see a strong storm or two, although the better chance for severe weather is going to be our, to our north, places like Dallas and Oklahoma City, and then there will be some very heavy snow. On the north side of this thing, places like uh, Colorado and Kansas are going to get hammered by some snows. This is one of those big springtime systems. We'll let you know what it means for us, and we'll time it out as we get a little bit closer. I think we'll have a, a better handle on it. But uh, for today, 75 degrees, partly to mostly cloudy as we get into the afternoon. 10 to 15 mile per hour winds out of the south and southeast. Near 80 next few days, and then a 60% chance of rain Saturday night into Sunday. Should clear out Sunday afternoon. And uh, we'll still salvage a pretty nice day there, 72 and then 76 on Monday, guys. Thank you, Justin. Wholesome Meats, a new company that works with farmers and ranchers. We started to tell you the story uh, last half hour. We're going to finish it today, how they're helping the food bank. They are really amazing. Lisa is the owner of The Cove, a local restaurant that aims for fresh, organic, sustainable, and delicious food. I really can tell the, the, the quality of the meat. Um, put it right here on the, on the grill. I mean, it just, it tastes so good. And this is their wholesome meats burger. This concept of regeneration is so exciting because it's not just sustainable. We're not just sustaining something. We're actually regenerating something. Wholesome Meats uses regenerative agriculture to produce their beef. The regenerative agriculture is a set of principles and techniques that farmers and ranchers use to help heal the planet. They, they graze their cattle on land and rotate them through different parts of, of their land so they never overgraze. They don't use chemicals or hormones and they always keep the ground covered. It seems simple and good for the environment. That actually allows uh, the grass to bring carbon from the atmosphere into the soil, which builds healthy, rich topsoil capturing carbon and, and basically healing the planet. This wholesome meats burger is delicious, nutritious, and today it actually helps the San Antonio Food Bank. Part of our mission is, you know, is local and part of local means that we're supporting one another. 
so uh, yeah, so so people come here and eat, and then that money is supporting the, the food bank, and so it's like a it's a win win. The win-win for the community. Right now, Wholesome Meats is working with ranchers in Texas, Oregon, California, and Wisconsin with a goal to give people healthy, nutritious beef and leave them with a cleaner planet. The farmers and ranchers are our heroes. We want them to become rich again. We want them to to uh, to feel proud about what they're doing and to raise uh, cattle in a way that's responsible and humane. And again, that that's uh, that heals the planet for all of us. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. SA Live cooking up a lot of fun. I was just looking at that burger going, Mike's probably got a burger where he is or something. To As a matter of fact, we don't, but hey, we got he's got a little ice. drinky we'll poo. In a second. There we go. Hey, Adina Anderson mm -hmm. is here. It is, of course, spring break. You brought a friend with you, too. I did. This is Miss Molly. I do a lot of pet friendly travel, and they are wanting us to come out. So when you're traveling, when you're road tripping, make sure you have a lot of snacks for the kids mm -hmm. and the pets. You want to make sure everybody is happy in the car while you're road tripping. And also, everybody's happy when you get there. And you said a lot of places are very, very pet friendly because they want folks to come. So bring the dogs, bring the kids, bring oh, yeah. everybody, right? Yeah, every, but I was surprised every single place we went was pet friendly. And most of them within what, maybe two hours of town here? To drive uh, it took town? about two and a half hours, yep. Okay, and then a little bit later on in the show as well, speaking of spring, you guys want to spruce up, so you're going to show us some nice spring decor, yes, right? Yes, I am. we got some flowers and ribbon and all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> all right. Okay, this is the time of year to fire up the grill, and you want some tips from the experts? Davila's Barbecue. Oh, my goodness gracious. I can taste, I can almost smell that just looking at that monitor. Tips from the pits, how you can really cook up some good barbecue. Alamo City Moms, they have some great spring break ideas, and this is where you can go, what you can do with the kids, just right here in town. There's so much to do around here, so we've got the